evaluating risk strategies for farms and ranches. Um, John Hewlett is our speaker on this topic. As I said, he's from uh, Laramie at the University of, of Wyoming and is a founding member uh, of Right Risk. With that, John, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you uh, enlighten us with uh, how to evaluate risk strategies. Okay, Jeff. Well, thank you for that introduction and for the opportunity to offer a few insights on uh, on a module we're working on. Uh, that module is titled Evaluating Risk Strategies, and it is online uh, to with the intention of assisting users to better understand uh, their strategies for managing risk. Today we'd like to cover a couple of the topics addressed by the module to give you a feel for the overall a uh, set of topics that are listed within it. Uh, we have this uh, short description here covering everything from an introduction to strategies for managing risk uh, to a discussion of how those strategies fit with the risk management goals of the management of the operation, various mechanisms for managing risk and how they might be used, uh, how to evaluate the effectiveness of risk strategies, uh, changing strategies, incorporating learning over time as, as adjustments may be necessary, and then uh, finishing up with the seven characteristics of a good decision and how they might be incorporated into developing a risk management strategy uh, moving forward. So a lot of ground there uh, covered by the overall module, but today we'd like to just cover a couple of those, uh, the first of which is risk management strategies. And then uh, we'll move on to discuss a little bit of the coverage of evaluating uh, risk strategies as, as touched on in the module. So we'll start off with uh, what is a strategy? That word's used a lot by different people to mean different things. But in general, a strategy should outline actions that utilize the resources available or provide a means of getting needed resources in order to accomplish a specific goal. In popular usage, strategy is often used to describe the means by which a person or business plans to use those resources to reach the desired ends. And in this way, a strategy implies the three points uh, listed on the screen, which, mean, which are a goal, there are some resources, and then there are some ideas about actions that might be taken or an approach that might be used to attain that goal using the resources that are available. So establishing a risk management goals and objectives might be a place where we'd start then. And so they're one method for describing what that future should look like. Uh, thinking through the steps can definitely help all the different people that might be involved in, in the action see what resources will be required as well as what changes must be made in the current operations and then what some of the milestones might be along the way as they move from where they are to where it is they hope to end up. So most farm and ranch operations have some idea of where they're headed. Fewer have formal written plans, and even a smaller number seem to have well-articulated, well-written uh, goals that are shared with everybody concerned. Those formal goals can provide the basis for monitoring business activity, uh, give input to management decision-making, and offer insights into appropriate contingency responses when external forces require some sort of mid-course corrections, which often seems to be the case. In the military, a strategy is a maneuver designed to deceive or even surprise an enemy. Uh, to be successful, a strategy requires all levels of management and labor to be aligned. As such, the strategy outlines a step-by-step -step approach uh, that we're planning to use to reach that desired outcome. Now, risk management plans are concerned with describing the specific steps and the timetable required for reaching the goals, and that includes the how and when of the process. So sometimes this phase is called action planning or programming or even implementation. Whatever terms it might be used, it refers to the list of the actions that must be accomplished to achieve the risk goals and the timing of those activities. So strategies for managing risk or the consequences of a negative event may vary by source of risk and level of protection already in place. 
So not all strategies are necessarily going to be appropriate for all different types of, of uh, negative events we might be looking at managing. So in general, the options range everywhere from avoiding the risky practice to possibly accepting the risk. Between these two extremes are several possibilities for managing risk to a more acceptable level by perhaps reducing the risk, transferring the risk, or increasing the capacity to bear the risk should those negative events occur. The risk avoidance is concerned with reducing or eliminating the possibility of events with unfavorable consequences. With foresight and the adoption of preventative measures, many situations can and probably should be avoided. So when considering both the risk and the possible preventative measures to take, the process should include both familiar and unfamiliar sources of risk. So avoiding the risk is accomplished when a manager takes an active decision to not engage in a particular practice or activity due to the level of risk that might be involved. Next uh, strategy we might think about is transferring the risk, which is an approach for shifting risk from one party to another, usually outside the business. Now this can be accomplished through insurance policies, by contracting, or by other sorts of agreements with a third party that might be willing to, to share in the negative consequences in return for a premium that is paid in advance. Evaluating insurance and marketing contracts can be frustrating if the person only does so after the fact. Once the outcome is determined, it's certainly tempting to declare the decision good or bad based on whether the contract worked out in one's own favor. That's really a bad habit to get into. Managers should take a sincere effort to evaluate the decision at the time it's made in terms of what it costs in premium and in the case of marketing contracts, uh, the potential upside against the premium cost associated with transferring that risk to a party outside of the farm or ranch organization. <laughs> so if we look at insurance as a mechanism for transferring the risk, uh, the risk is transferred from an individual to a corporation or some other party that can more readily tolerate the risk. The purchaser pays more than the expected indemnity to avoid ever being exposed to the risk. Now, the party on the other side of the transaction earns income from the risk premiums, and in this way it can afford to pay for accidents and catastrophes because it's pooling that risk over many different people, uh, operations, or even types of coverage. So insurance contracts have the effect of truncating the net income distribution, as you might notice on the screen there, where the purchaser... Uh, is protected against uh, downward movements uh, on the downside in exchange for pay paying the insurance premium every year. So marketing tools like a put option also work in exactly the same way as, uh, as insurance does in this case. Uh, contracting is another approach for transferring risk for one person or a business to another. And in this case, uh, futures and options markets are examples of, of this type of uh, contract or a transaction, forward contracts for livestock and selling grain to an elevator before harvest are also other examples. So keep in mind that the incentives must exist for each side in the exchange for the two different parties to see an advantage to locking in a sale agreement and giving up the flexibility to do something different at a later date. So again, there needs to be an advantage on both sides uh, if there's going to be any incentive for them to get together. Now, controlling risk is another kind of an interesting dimension. It's by far the most active form of managing risk. However, it is also very important that the decision maker keep in mind that the goal of risk management is to manage risk to a more acceptable level, not necessarily to minimize the risk when you're looking at these various alternatives. In many situations, this can best be accomplished by finding strategies that improve the level of expected returns rather than reduce the variation in outcomes. In general, controlling risk is taking management action to change the outcomes for an event by either making negative outcomes less likely or possibly reducing the consequence 
should they actually occur. We should always keep in mind that it's very seldom that, that the operator can choose to do both at the same time. It's usually an either-or situation. So managing with the intent to reduce the chances of bad events happening is just common sense for most ag operators. For example, a piece of machinery can break down at any moment. The risk of machinery breakdown can be controlled by properly maintaining the machine, which reduces the chance it will break down and it extends its useful life as well as saving money on costly repairs. The manager must compare the extra expense of maintaining the machine with the benefit that that has by reducing the probability of a breakdown to evaluate whether or not that actually might be a good strategy for them. Of course, methods for reducing the chances of bad events are not free, nor do they cover every situation. So some events uh, are simply too expensive to reduce the chances for, while other events are so unlikely that the manager basically should not worry about ever having to worry about managing them or having them occur. Now controlling the impact is another another method for managing uh, risk and it involves using strategic risk management tools like diversification, uh, extra reserves, uh, or maintaining flexibility to reduce the impact of a bad outcome or increase the benefits of a good outcome. Now, diversification is likely already clear to most farmers and ranchers. Following a practice, for example, of growing more than one crop or operating a farm with both crop and livestock enterprises can be a method for reducing the impact on the overall operation when, say, markets turn down or production levels are lower than expected. As with other strategies for reducing impact, diversification comes with a unique set of costs. Managing a farm with multiple crops Requiring windows, separate equipment, each with separate marketing windows and management challenges, creates a lot of additional overhead. Uh, such operations are clearly more resilient in a changing economy. However, they also limit the possibilities for participating in upward trending markets because the strategy restricts their production to only a portion of the total possible in any one market. Uh, having extra cash reserve in hand will definitely reduce the impact of poor revenue in a given year, but evaluating this strategy is a matter of considering what it costs in potential income to keep those extra reserves on hand versus the earnings that they might bring in in another use. However, holding extra reserves has, has a cost as well. The value of this strategy must be compared with others available before simply selecting this one as the best. And then finally, maintaining flexibility. Uh, there are certainly circumstances where the decision maker may feel that there is not enough information to justify making a clear choice. It may be clear that doing nothing is not the best course to follow either. In such cases, a good strategy might be to commit to, to a set of smaller changes or adjustments following practices similar to what were used in the past, but retain the flexibility to make further changes when it's clear that they are warranted. In this way, the manager is attempting to remain proactive in circumstances that suggest change is needed while retaining the capacity to be more fully responsive as better data or clearer single signals become available. And then finally, accepting risk. Now, some risks are too costly to control or the negative consequence may be too small to bother with managing. In these cases, management may choose to simply accept the risk as a cost of doing business with the idea that the business will cover the entire cost should a negative event actually occur. This approach is sometimes referred to as self-insuring. Basically, we would shoulder all the costs should it ever that bad event ever occur. Now keep in mind that taking on risk is usually associated with some sort of potential reward. That's where a lot of the profit in farming and ranching actually exists. However, this should be done with careful evaluation of the potential impacts and the willingness to accept the probability of their occurrence. And so with that, Jeff, that's about what I have to share from the risk strategies section of the module. 
I'll turn it back to you now uh, to allow Jay to cover the remaining segment of the module we were looking to, to get through this morning. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, that was a great presentation, and it's quite evident that you have many years of experience coaching farmers, ranchers, and others as they attempt to better manage their businesses. Uh, your presentation also suggests that you have um, gone through this process of evaluating risk strategies um, with your own operation, uh, having multiple enterprises uh, there outside of Laramie. Uh, a couple of questions have been put forth uh, by people participating in this audience, so if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, put those forward to you. Uh, the first uh, you mentioned avoiding risk as a strategy that may be appropriate for some to consider. Uh, could you give us an example or two of what that might look like? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> examples I often talk about are uh, <laughs> cases we run into here in Wyoming, at least. Do you hear them, of them uh, around in the, west of the rest of the West? Uh, things like people considering running both cattle and sheep uh, you know, there's cultural things and stigmas against that. So some operators, operations, um, especially in the last couple of decades, have chosen to focus just on one. But there are a lot of folks that, that now basically run uh, both. Uh, the reason for maybe not running uh, both types of enterprises uh, would be that you view that there's, you know, lack of familiarity on your part uh, or that you're not clear about uh, how to market those animals. Another example often comes up would be holding uh, calves to yearlings. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research that suggests that doing so is to your financial advantage, and yet clearly running yearlings has additional fencing and holding uh, you know, equipment uh, issues tied to it, but also a lot of marketing implications, and a lot of operators just choose not to do that, rather uh, focusing more on an enterprise they're more familiar with. So uh, those are a couple of examples. Uh, in the cropping side of things, clearly there'd be people that have, you know, chosen to focus on just one or two crops where maybe other crops are viable in their, you know, in their area of production. And they do that either because it's it's simpler or because they, you know, reduce some of the input costs, uh, equipment costs, etc. Um, and and in that way, they, you know, are sort of focusing on a one or two sort of uh, enterprises in, a, in an attempt to avoid the risk that might be bound up in some of those other alternatives. Uh, it's not necessarily the best strategy for everyone, uh, but the challenge is uh, for folks to kind of think that through in terms of the risk that these alternatives uh, might imply for the overall operation and then make a choice as to whether or not, you know, that actually seemed like the better strategy or if maybe one of these other mechanisms uh, available for controlling risk or managing risk uh, would be a more appropriate in the situation that they're facing. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, a second question that was put up is uh, you talked about increasing reserves in order to control the impact. Uh, this person is not clear how that might apply to a real-world situation. Uh, could you help... Uh, us better understand what you mean with that? Yeah, of course, the example I talked about earlier was uh, cash reserves, and clearly having extra cash on hand to meet unexpected expenses is a, would be a great luxury, although a lot of operations don't necessarily have that, op you know, that opportunity to do so. Uh, and to do so actually costs clearly any interest that you might be able to earn on it or returns if you invested that money into an active enterprise. There are other examples that come to mind uh, that we maybe don't think of all that often, like holding extra hay in a in a haystack or having other inputs that we, you know, buy in at a discount because we're buying in a quantity uh, that lets us get a lower price. Uh, those may be really good strategies, depending on how it fits in with the rest of your management, but they might also be extent expensive strategies. Uh, I guess part of the point of bringing this up is that those sorts of strategies are, in fact, risk management strategies, uh, and they certainly can save money, but they also may be costing you some money. Uh, in the case of uh, extra hay in the haystack, I mean, if you had the opportunity to sell that hay, uh, clearly leaving it in the stack for someday when an emergency might come up, 
uh, has a cost to it versus the cash you might be able to receive. And then, you know, if that uh, negative event occurred, maybe you could use that cash to buy in hay uh, in that circumstance. Um, if you view it as a fairly rare uh, event, maybe selling the hay is a better a better strategy on a regular basis versus holding it and foregoing the extra income that that might represent. So I think we do a lot of this type of, of uh, increasing reserves as a, a strategy within typical ag operations, but we don't often think about the negative consequence of, of that uh, inventory and the cost that it may represent to the operation. So challenge here is really to just think that through again and, and to consider whether that's the best strategy or if uh, you know, if there may be some other alternatives for managing risk that may help you achieve your goals that don't require you to hold those those reserves. Uh, that's uh, a great answer. I know as I've been around, uh, like many of us, uh, working with producers, you'll see uh, two of something or extra hay, like you say, in the stackyard. And, and I know it's a, a risk management, but I, you know, we don't even think of it uh, as having a cost associated with it and, and looking at that. So that was a great explanation of that. Um, so uh, wanting to be sensitive to people's time, uh, I want to thank you again for your enlightening uh, presentation, John. Uh, I believe the producers, agency professionals, and others gained some quite useful information uh, from your presentation and your answering those questions. Uh, I will share with the audience uh, at a later time after Jay speaks on how they can access you, uh, the two, both presentations and additional information. Uh, again, I'll do that um, after Jay's presentation at the end. So thanks again, John.